Um, in 2009, uh, I decided to try another mythic painting. This is six by nine feet on two uh, six by 54 inch canvases. Uh, the painting is called Antonia, no, Octavia and Antonia divide the empire. I love, uh, you know, uh, Greek, Greco-Roman history. And uh, this is when the young Octavian and the old Caesarian general Antony divide uh, 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 up the, uh, the then republic after the Battle of Mutina. And I decided to turn my, my generals into uh, women. And, uh, uh, but I've got, you know, the swords and knives on the floor and, and you know, the gold and booty uh, moving in the directions of the two generals. Um, right after painting that painting, I went back downtown. Uh, and this, remember I'd shown you that view from the academy looking east. And this is what became of that view in 2009. All those buildings were torn down so that the convention center could be doubled in size out to Broad Street. So in 2009, in early May, I decided I would try to paint the progress of the construction site. And this was painted in a 40-day sprint from uh, early May to July the 19th of 2009. It's an absolutely impossible thing in the sense that you could never have seen the construction site looking like this at any one time. It's a, a composite, a kind of jigsaw puzzle, adding, subtracting, to sort of try to make a, a viable pictorial rhythm, and, and yet to capture all the, uh, the energy of the paintings. A critic in Philly who had been very sort of occasionally charitable and occasionally uncharitable to my work, described my earlier cityscapes as looking and feeling empty. And that, that crushed me at the time. That was back in 2004. So I wanted to see if I could make a, a cityscape that really did teem with life. And if you were able to get close enough, you'd see there's, there's over 50 figures in that picture moving around on the, the metal work and stuff. The painting in size, is uh, six by 12 feet, six by 12 feet on three canvases. Uh, a year later, I was painting portraits again. And this, for me, not everyone agrees, but for me, this is about the best uh, portrait of a type that I've painted, I think. This is my effort to really compete with a tradition that goes back to Titian and goes all the way up to uh, uh, Sargent and, and Leonard Anderson. Uh, uh, and uh, it's life size, 56 inches tall. It's called Portrait of Chenda. Uh, and it was painted in, uh, in seven sittings, so it's fast. Um, this is the maddest painting I've ever done. This is uh, seven by 22 feet. And it is painted from life in an elevator lobby where I teach at the academy. It's on four canvases. Uh, it started out as a single canvas, the, sen the second from the left, which I thought would be a nice, polite cityscape. And then I immediately decided that wasn't interesting enough. And it doubled in size. So the two, for a long time, the painting was the two central panels. And then it doubled in size again uh, to go into the lobby and out to the left. That's the Academy's Furness building, the museum building that you can see on the left. And the figure on the far right you'll see more of. He's a recent painting student of mine named Paul Matrinko. And he's become my latest archetype of the young man. There he is again. This is called Telemachus and the Sirens. So it's self-explanatory. It's uh, seven, six and a half, I think, by seven and a half feet. And uh, it's a view, uh, it's actually above the previous, this is on the 10th floor, the one you just saw was on the fourth floor. And I, I, I'll do this, periodically I'll go for whole years where I will paint in public. 
these are all paintings where I'm out uh, bringing models in and uh, uh, daring anyone to fuck with me. Uh, uh, <laughs> and, and the way you do that is you appear to be insane and people leave you alone. Uh, well, it just gets worse. Uh, this is uh, 8 by 12 and a half feet. Uh, I finally made a painting that I cannot show anywhere. Uh, except in a church for a religion not yet known. Uh, this is called Orpheus and Eurydice. And it's actually, uh, you know, I kid, but this was, I, I've done so many paintings that have a kind of light heart about their historic or, or mythological roots. And this is actually a, a sort of serious moment. This is uh, the moment when Eurydice, Orpheus has bargained the freedom of his wife from Hades. And Hades is down there, dark in the stairwell. He's my painter friend, Richard Estelle. And there's Cerberus, my, my new husky, uh, Courtney, over on the right. And uh, uh, Orpheus is there with the guitar, heading towards the light, the lighted door on the far right. The flying women, uh, I, I mean, this started out as an excuse to paint flying women, but it, it they're the mean ads, the, the, uh, the, the mad uh, Thracian women that will eventually rip Orpheus to shreds. You see a little sickle up there. It's not a covert elegy for Marxist-Leninism. Uh, it's, it's a myth, but, but I do have a sickle up there. And the Eurydice is at the top of the stairs, and this is the moment when Eurydice uh, is following Orpheus back out of the underworld, uh, and Orpheus is about to look over his shoulder. And Eurydice has, the, the deal he's made with Hades is if he looks back, uh, Eurydice shall return. But this, play, this story has been undertaken by a contemporary playwright named Sarah Rule, I think her name is. And Sarah Rule tells the story of the Orpheus and Eurydice from Eurydice's point of view. And the contention of her play is that Eurydice chooses to return to the underworld because the person that, that she's leaving behind that she most loves is her father, who is, who is a shade. So uh, the guy down at the bottom of the stairwells isn't actually Hades, it's, it's, or, it's Eurydice's father. And then my wife Jan is over there on the left waiting in the upper world with a bouquet of greeting while at the moment when Eurydice makes her choice. This was painted, took the best part of a year, uh, uh, insanely difficult painting to do because uh, it, I did not know, it, I wanted to see if I could paint figures moving in a flying space or in space better than I had before and, uh, and it meant having figures sitting up on ladders and uh, uh, lying down and I, you know, I'd actually bring figures out into this, this space where my studio is, and that's where people come and go when they're coming in and out of the studio. It's just nuts. Um, that's, uh, your Orpheus and Eurydice brings me to this point in my career. That's the 30-year greatest hits. And then I, what I want to do is just finish with a quick survey in a little more depth of the motifs that have been sort of, have fed my practice. So I'm going to give you a little expanded view of a few of, of some of this imagery. Uh, this is a, a painting done in the early 90s, uh, Still Life with Ceramic Flowers too, which uh, it's kind of self-explanatory, but it's, well, the, the story isn't self-explanatory, but it, I think it actually goes well with the, uh, the Orpheus and Eurydice picture. You can sort of see that the, the same stuff's been burning in my head for a very long time, this free-flowing world of things that are perceived, things that can be seen, but are unmoored from their, uh, uh, their normal gravitational relations. Uh, this is, was painted in the 90s, uh, 40 by 50. Uh, it's called Narcissus and Cherry Pie. And it was a high point for me at the time I did it. It's called Composition with Still Life, painted in the 90s. Uh, the still lifes for me 
are always like touchstone things to do, but they're also laboratories for more mythic intentions. And I think the, the, the real power of storytelling for me is to the degree to which it can be embedded in formal terms. And if you look at the rhyming of the arms, the, uh, the Parthenon horsemen, the patterns on the cloth, the, the overlapping and layering, I think you get some sense of what I was, what I was interested in. Uh, this is uh, 75 inches across, no big story, uh, uh, but a painting that I, I'm very fond of. Uh, this is painted in the nine, uh, no, about six years ago. It's called Ice Fishing. Uh, this is my more macabre sense of humor. Think of the woman on the right, Vivian, as a young seal about to breach the ice. And, and uh, you get the idea. Uh, the, the rhymes of studio stuff and figure are an almost endless occasion for play, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, I do a lot of, of, of very direct painting. And the, these last two still lifes are one-shot paintings of the food I love to paint and rarely get to eat. I'm, I'm like King Tantalus. I get to paint it, but I can't eat it. Uh, although I did, I did this, my wife makes these great pies, and she will let me take the pie if I swear to bring it back. So I have to paint it in a day so that we can, we can have it at home. These are, th both of these paintings were about 20 inches across. Uh, this is a, a recent still life from about a year ago that I'm kind of fond of. It's called Ship of Fools. And the fools are down there on the second shelf. You can still see this little mob of toys down there. Uh, the Sandman and Mia Ham and a dinosaur and stuff like that. Uh, the other, uh, another crucial sort of laboratory for the imagination for me is Cityscape. Uh, it was probably the last of these, these categories to emerge for me, uh, but it's, it's been one of the richest over the last 20 years. This was painted about 10 years ago. It's called Emerald City, and it's another view from that old factory space. This was painted downtown. Uh, and uh, it's about uh, 64 inches tall. This is a pastel, 40 by uh, 60. Uh, this is seven feet tall. Uh, it's called the Metropolitan. And it's a, uh, uh, an, in, an essay in bending space. Uh, the cityscapes are always sort of, uh, great backdrops or movie screens for the figure. Uh, th th this is just very straightforward. But it was done just a little over a year ago uh, in my uh, done at school. This was the last of the, no, this was. This is called Dane or Danai 2. And it's a model uh, playing the role of the, of the mortal who is being visited by Zeus except my Zeus happens to be a decommissioned Episcopal church. Uh, the other perennial thing for me in all the years of my working life has been uh, the, the love of working from the figure, particularly the, the, the nude, the, particularly the female nude. This is a pastel from about 10 years ago of uh, one of my many uh, heroic collaborators, Daisy Freed, noted uh, poet, contemporary poet. Uh, and this is part of the way she funded her poetry for a time. Uh, this is Vivian playing Lita. Uh, and uh, this is an oil 72 inches across. That's Kali. Uh, this is named after the Peggy Lee song, Is That All There Is? Uh, we were bonding over Peggy Lee while this was painted. And since I knew there was no chance it would ever be sold, why not give it a ridiculous title? 
Uh, this is in the current show across the street in the library. This is uh, Kali, the woman you just saw, who is about to exit modeling service. She's graduated to a better life. She's married well and doesn't need this stupid work anymore. Uh, Michelle, you saw earlier as Antonia in the Octavian Antonia picture. In fact, those were Kali and Michelle in that painting. This was painted about two years ago, three years ago. Uh, this is uh, called Lilith, uh, the uh, God's first try at a, a female consort for Adam. Uh, Lilith was much too wild and had to be repeat, replaced by a more tractable Eve. And I've tried to make my Lilith look like a lot of fun and a lot of mayhem. Uh, and then finally, I just want to finish with a few portraits because portraiture is, is, is also key to me. I don't think I would paint the nude if they weren't specific people. Uh, and so maybe the nude for me is not so much the master category. The master category for me is probably portraiture. Uh, this is a portrait of my wife Jan done almost 30 years ago. Uh, as a sort of a Michelangesque Sybil. This is a 40-inch uh, pastel and grisaille, and it's a pastel and gouache. This is a painter friend of mine named Betsy Batchelor, and this was painted in the uh, late 80s. Uh, those of you who know Degas' work might know the painting Madame Gaugelin, uh, favorite painting of Leonard Anderson's, and this is my entry in the, uh, that sweepstakes. There's Kali, uh, 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 but she's playing the role of Medea. Uh, this is a life-size, six-foot painting, and you know who Medea was. This is, this is when Medea has learned of Jason's infidelity, and she's contemplating the unthinkable. Uh, and uh, uh, I think I've tried to give her all the regal resources of a, of, a, of a queen, a goddess, and a sorceress. That's also, I'm very proud to say, another life painting of a dog. That's Carolyn Pyfrom, who is also in the show. That's her on the right. And she is wrangling her Doberman pincher, Sasha, uh, who I painted in two hours flat into the painting. Uh, this uh, is Sue. Kalinsky, a favorite collaborator. This was done in 2010. And the last slide I'll show you is uh, of Michelle. Uh, and uh, this was painted about three years ago. And uh, not that, no great story to say, except uh, it's, it's, it sums up, I think, in a single picture, almost everything that really matters to me in making paintings, the meeting of of the, the seen world, the observed world, with a kind of mythic life of painting. And that's it. Hey, Chris, how are you? Good to see you. It was, yeah. Well, um, w like I say, when I, the, for most y artists, drawing comes earlier and with more mastery than, say, painting does. And so when I was your age, I felt more fluent in drawing. And pastel is really not truly a drawing medium, it's more of a painting medium, but it, it has some of the track, it has some of the felicities of drawing. It can feel more controllable. And so pastel was a way of, of working on things that are important to painting in, in a, in a, with means that I felt I could control. And, uh, and probably 30 years ago, 60, 70 percent of my work was pastel. Now it's, uh, I still do a lot of it. I hardly ever show them. Uh, they, they, I don't, for some, most of what I exhibit for many years, 20 years, have been, have been the paintings. But uh, I, I think uh, 
painting is, well, it depends on your temperament, but painting is complex. I mean, we were talking about it today in the, uh, uh, the workshop, how one of the themes of, of the workshop today was thinking of, of picture making as layered consciousness. Like there's so many things that are going on when you're doing a picture. And for some reason, for me, when I was young, pastel was a way to keep my studio practice going as I tried to get all these issues in sync. Like, uh, I think for every artist, those issues vary. But I bet you anybody I asked could give me a menu of things that they're concerned with as an artist and feel real difficulty in getting them to sort of uh, uh, integrate into what they're doing. Does that make sense? So pastel for me was a, a crucially important medium to just, in a sense, hang on until painting seemed to catch up with what I was thinking about. Uh, uh, I, I think other painters are different, but I don't think I was a natural painter uh, when I was young. Uh, uh, I think I'm much more natural now, but I took a lot of square miles of canvas to get there. I will say one thing for any of you guys that are interested in pastels relationship to painting. If pastel technically differs crucially from painting, first of all it's dry, but also it differs in the, the way color and value sort out. Like the value range of pastel is much narrower than the, the possible value range in oil paint. Does that make sense to any of you guys? Like it's just not as big a spread of value. So, well, well, I, here, well, all I, well, I, you would really, well, because I, <laughs> I can make much denser blacks much quicker in oil paint than I can in pastel. Pastel, well, uh, let me put it this way too: pa good pastels are sold chromatically by value, not by color, but by value. And what I learned, what I struggled with in oil paint was actually I would race two pictures that were organized with fairly broad value ranges when I was a young painter. I don't think I showed you any of those disasters because it was so heartrending to watch paintings turn to solarized umber muck against white highlights, but that happened to me a lot as a young painter. So when I would work with pastel, I seemed to be naturally able to keep the value range narrower and in keeping it narrower, color got to do a better job. It got to do a richer job, for at least for me. And so I learned something through the medium of pastel that became very important in my painting practice, which was to learn to be less literal about value, and in a sense to be less literal about color as well. If you're a, a, a representational or an observational painter, which I am, I, everything I think I've showed you, was mostly done from observation, one way or the other. Um, when you're looking at nature, nature gives you all kinds of information. And one of its most tempting bits of information is a really rich range of contrast and value and color. And as a painter, I felt I had to learn to control those ranges more, to be more in charge of the, of, of the scale of the range. And pastel naturally encouraged that until I could say, oh yeah, I could do that in painting too. I could be less literal about color and value. I mean, that, that's one of a life painter's big problems. At least it certainly was mine, which is literalness. You know, like thinking, oh, there's the information, just copy it. Just seize that relationship. Because uh, remember I talked a little bit about inside-outside paintings. Inside-outside paintings, the, the, the color value event is so broad, you can't be literal about it. You, to get any chance at capturing the difference of the two worlds, you have to squeeze the color value in the two worlds, you know? So if you're a, a, a dumb realist like I am, it takes a lot of learning to understand the degree to which you have to invent to be true. <laughs> you have to... What's that great Picasso-esque line? Uh, art is a lie that tells the truth. It took me a long time to understand the lies that I had to master 
to have any chance at telling the truth of my experience. And Pastel really helped me with that. Well, you asked me that earlier, and let me, I, I, like I say, I, w I think I know what you mean. I would not use language like exactly like that. What I would sort of say is that when I'm painting from observation, the reason I do that, I, at least partly, is because I think the world is spectacularly beautiful all the time. It looks like the most fabulous thing. But I don't think I saw that beauty very clearly until I became a painter. Sometimes I'm tempted to think that the, 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 the beauty of the world only for me becomes fully evident in the act of painting. When I'm walking around like a civilian, I think, yeah, it looks pretty good. But when I paint it, it really gets beautiful to me in some way. So if, the, if, if things, places, and qualities in the world, the people I meet, the places I paint, have uh, an intrinsic beauty that I'm, as you say, a vessel for communicating maybe or something. Maybe that's the case, I don't know. But I do know that, that the world, uh, I, I sort of recognize the world in the painting in some way. The painting becomes a way of, 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 of com doing a sort of homage to it or a service to it. I, I was talking to my students though the other day, I was, I was thinking we were, we were looking at great painting and sometimes when you're looking at great painting you're tempted to ask could I or would I like to live in that world? Like if I could live in a Vermeer, would I live in a Vermeer? If I could live in a Piero, would I live there? And I thought, what a horrifying thought. The most beautiful painting in the world would be the most horrible place to live. You, you know what I mean? Uh, because the relationship in a work of art are so overdetermined, so de deeply thought out and worked out that. Well, I think that happens. I mean, if you paint or you do any kind of art where there's a large degree of, of sort of stamina and fidelity and required. Like, you know, any, you know, my standard for this was that guy Lopez Garcia that might work on a painting for, t you know, 10 years. I mean, that's unfathomable to me. I don't, I can't imagine. But when I started working on paintings for months and as my stamina grew, I could paint for, you know, six, seven, eight hours at a stretch without a break because that's what was necessary to be prepared to seize the light at a given time. Like all those cityscapes are, record the light of a given time of day. But to paint, say, a big cityscape at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, I got to start at 8.30 in the morning getting the painting moving so that I'm in position to, to feel that light. And when you do that, you get, you get into a state, basically. You get in, you're, you're not you're not in the same place. Uh, it's a very nice place. It's, it's a place of self-forgetting in a way. It's a place of intense concentration. And uh, it's, it's not exactly a meditation, but, it's, but it has qualities like that. So if that's what you're talking about, that happens all the time, uh, if you're lucky. And, and I think artists who value that have to arrange their lives in a way ways for that to happen. You know, you have to be able to uh, simplify things and create conditions. I mean, the reason I paint the world close at hand, friends, models, the immediate neighborhood, is because they're available to me for that kind of scrutiny, you know, spending that much time. So, yes. It really depends. Like, you know, some of those small still lifes are started with no drawing. And the little demo painting I did today, 
uh, you know, started with no drawing, just pieces of color. Uh, some of those big cityscapes, though, uh, I will do a kind of basic mapping of large shape locations, things like that. But generally speaking, I don't do, I don't do prepar preparatory drawings. I don't do, uh, I don't do a detailed drawing on canvas. I, I usually start right away, and then I make corrections or I make changes. Does that answer the question? Yeah. If you saw the paintings, they're, I don't know that they're tight. Actually, you might be disappointed. They're actually pretty broad, pretty open. I mean, I, I, I have a taste for a fairly large piece of paint. Like, I paint a lot with house painter's brushes and, and palette knives and things like that. And then the details are pulled out of large passages of wet paint. Uh, and I've, I guess my own commitments as a realist are more towards precision of tone and color than the accumulation of detail. Because if I had my druthers, I'd like even the largest painting to feel like it happened all at once. Doesn't, but I'd like it to feel that way. I mean, my standard a little bit is fresco painting. You know, uh, you know all those frescoes, what you actually see is painted in a single sitting. It's a bunch of a la prima paintings, you know, and uh, I happen to like that idea a lot. I, I, I mean, every one of those dog paintings is just what you saw. Like, like the, the one, the Eurydice painting, the, uh, my, my silver uh, gray husky, I had, uh, you know, Patrice was holding the dog like this and, you know, petting her and, and you know, she went like this and then she'll look at me. And, and you, you learn, the great thing about life painting is it builds in you certain capacities because you got to get them in some way. So you learn... Like, you know, I was asked, talking to you about detail in paintings. All of, like, every face I've painted for years, the heads you see, those portraits, the feature, the, the relationship of the features of the head is all one day of painting or one sitting. It might be two or three tries, but it's all, like, wet, you know? So if I'm painting an animal, I've got somebody, you know, petting the dog, holding it, and then i got to get it. And what I sometimes find is I can paint certain large things that move less often, like a torso or a neck or the mass of a head. And then when I got that wet and I've got the ground around the head wet, usually if I'm bold, I can very quickly you know, seize a profile and then drop the dots in. But that's based on you know, 35 years of almost continuous life drawing. I mean, like I, I work uh, I mean, fortunately for me, it's something I happen to really enjoy, but I draw a lot from the figure where I'm making these total commitments very fast. And if you do that a lot, you, you get better and better at it. And I don't know that there are actually tricks. There, there are efficiencies possible. Yeah. Anybody else? Uh, that's, that's an embarrassing question, because uh, <laughs> the, the bad news is I do own most of those large paintings. I mean, that's, that's what's so in suicidal about this business, is you, 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 you get bored with doing reasonable paintings, paintings that people would actually like to have, and, and, and out of sheer ego, you say, well, I'm going to do this. And the world will love it. I just know it. <laughs> and then they don't. And so I, I basically have, uh, uh, you know, I, I, I spend ruinous amounts of money on everything. I think last year I, I hit six grand in model fees. I pay 
seven grand in uh, you know uh, studio rent because ha you know a third of my studio is devoted to storing those damn things you know and uh, and I think when I die uh, we'll build uh, a, a Viking longboat, <laughs> set it on fire, and send me out to sea, and and you know and it'll be okay. That will have been a good life because. I wouldn't trade anything for the pleasure of having made those things. Uh, uh, but, but you asked the real question. I mean, doing you know, stuff like this, or doing, doing anything as an artist, is an absolute you know, fool's bar gamble. You know? I mean, uh, you, you, you do it because you have to do it and you love it. And, uh, and, and Mostly that's good enough, you know. I mean, I, 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 it's not, it isn't as dark as that. I mean, over my career, I've, you know, I've placed close to 400 paintings, you know. So, I mean, things go, you know, but, but I've always painted and way out of sync with whatever the market was that could absorb it, and it's just getting worse. I mean, you know, <laughs> you know I think every now and then my, my, my wife looks at me like, you know that scene in Of Mice and Men where George is telling Lenny about the rabbits before he, sh <laughs> before sh you know, he shoots him in the back of the head, you know? <laughs> I think every now and then, you know, Jan gives me a rabbit to pet, you know, and then I just check. <laughs> okay. Anyway, any other questions? Really, I, I, had, a, I had a teacher once and he was the best teacher I ever had, but he said, Scott, if you can do anything else and be happy, do that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what was your question? Uh, what you were saying about how abstract crazy your No, I wasn't really kidding. <laughs> Actually, no, I act like this, <laughs> which is crazy. You know, I, I have conversations with people and, you know, they all come and say, what are you painting? <laughs> <laughs> Actually, it really doesn't. I mean, I, I, that's another thing that has, it, it did when I was a kid, but I, like I say, I, I bring people into my studio all the time. There are people continuously coming in and out, and one of the tricks of getting you know, a restless young man or woman to sit or stand for you for three or four hours while you paint them is you have to entertain them. You know, uh, I mean, I, I conduct interviews with people. I do psychoanalysis. I do <laughs> job counseling. I do a lot of work on damaged love lives. And I get what I need. And, and, <laughs> and, and the, the funny thing is what might have seemed obnoxious when I was young Actually, it becomes kind of fun because you know what happens when you're engaging with people while you paint is you're forgetting yourself. What I've learned is, at least in my case, it's good if this part of me that's talking to you now gets out of the way of the part that's making the painting. So talking and, and engaging with folks has a funny little side benefit for me. It makes me trust my own sort of reflexes when I'm painting. I have to, you know, and, and my reflexes are actually... Well, they're interesting. They're more interesting than anything that I can that I can ration reason out ahead of time. Any other questions? Sure. What was that? My posture. Well, you can sort of see I'm enduring some damage. I used to be really good looking, and and, <laughs> and after after 30 years of doing that, you know, uh, and uh, I mean, I think there's been a couple hernias. There's, uh, you know, no, no, you, it's not, it's, but as you know, it's not, you know, moving furniture or something like that. So. Uh, I, no, you, if, you're, if you're working standing, and that's what I do, because uh, I just like to work standing, you learn to uh, you know, stand up straight, you know, uh, 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 you, uh, you, know, I, you know, work on your posture as best you can, wear good shoes, you know, uh, and, uh, uh, and actually, in a, in very seriously, 
you got to take care of yourself a little bit. You know, like I, I, I'm not a health nut, but, but I realize that, that what I want to do as a painter is physically demanding. So I have to keep my life sort of simple and as, uh, and I try to do as little unnecessary damage to myself as possible so that I've got my best juice for what I do. But I actually think the, the, the painting life for most practitioners actually is fairly healthful. I mean, uh, uh, you know, I, I, a, lot, a lot of painters live quite long time. And uh, yeah, so just stand up straight. Don't, you know, don't, I mean, why would you paint like that? I mean, you know, I mean, you know that, huh? Well, if it feels good, uh, you know. But yeah, no, I think early on, I, I, I yeah, I, I like to have it like here so I can, you know, you know, uh, I have to now, your eyes start to go as you get older, and I, I'm wearing an inadequate prescription because if I strengthen my ne distance vision, I wreck my near vision, you know, and then I have to get a bifocal. So right now I'm sort of in this sweet spot, but that's made me have to mix like this because if I have my palette up here where I used to, I can't see it anymore. So, you know, <laughs> so, you know, yeah, but I'll tell you, Painting also has the great virtue of reconciling you to your mortality. You almost feel like as you're, you're, as you're decaying, and you really, do, do, you, do you feel the decay? I mean, you know, shit just starts breaking, you know, like, what, what did I do, you know? And, 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 but for some reason, you know, you're wearing a good painting, it's okay. I, my wife can tell you stories of, you know, uh, we get summons for, a, I got summoned for a tax audit, root canals, things like that. You know, weird stuff happening. And if I just keep painting, I'm okay. You know, if I, if I give in to the disaster, you know, it's free fall. But if I paint or finish the painting, then I can go deal with whatever the calamity is and I'm all right. So I think you'll be okay. Well, if you notice, over the last 10 years of painting, there were a lot of like covert or explicit format things. Like a lot of the cityscapes were, were done on irregular formats, you know, like they were staggered. And then quite a, f maybe more paintings than even you guys noticed, or maybe I didn't show that many of them. I've been exp exp uh, experiment experimenting for a few years with, with something I first saw in, Chardin's work, but also Ewan Uglo and Edwin Dickinson, which is a frame within a frame, where you have a canvas and then you might uh, inscribe a tondo or an ellipse in the picture. And the reason I got involved with that was because, you know, like even when I'm painting an elliptical object in a still life, the meeting of the ground tones against the curve of the bowl was an intensely pleasurable thing to paint, the meeting of those shapes on that turning edge. And I started to suspect that one of the reasons artists liked formats like that was because of the kinds of shapes that were created by the ground against that curving surface. Does that make sense? So the reason I, I started doing that was partly for a kind of pleasure, to sort of create a secondary geometry within the picture that, that the, uh, the illusionistic geometry was relating to. And, I, and, and it relates to all the themes of inside, outside, layering of motifs, things like that. The idea of having any kind of subject that you have a conven conventional set of assumptions about, like a portrait or a figure against a ground, and creating some condition where there's a real intersection or a meeting that creates painting challenges, like how do you honor that exterior geometry against the illusion. And I also think of it a little bit thematically, like one of my favorite uh, uh, metaphors for painting is thinking of paintings as clearings, places where something comes into view that is charged and, and, and deeply uh, rich in terms of its internal relations, you know, like a moment where everything makes sense. So the ellipse or the irregular format uh, becomes another way of asserting that, of saying that the
the painting is a fiction and not just an illusion. That, I, you know, that's a fancy answer. Maybe the best answer is I just like doing it. And in all the paintings you've seen, I think they're, I mean, I think this is one of the, uh, it's a risky thing to do in terms of your career. A lot of my work functions as an homage to things I like. And this is very nakedly that. I mean, you know, I should probably have footnotes with those paintings, you know. Uh, Chardin's Hanging Duck of 1759, uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, Raphael's XYZ Tondo, you know what I mean? Like, these refer to things, too. Everyone, you should probably keep asking questions tonight. Yeah. So thank you so much for your generosity. My pleasure. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you.